Hello and welcome to the Reformers podcast for Monday the 25th of September. The year's disappearing very quickly. Mm. And I'm joined tonight by uh, two of our regulars, Ed Selly and Ian is here as well. So good evening, guys. Hello, sir. Uh, bit of a short uh, podcast tonight. We're going to be around for about an hour. Uh, reduction in the team because uh, little bits and pieces, lots of things happening. It's that time of the year. Um, so other people are away doing other bits and pieces. But we will be back for the next one with a full team. But tonight we're going to entertain you with... Uh, well, quite a bit, actually. I'm going to be reporting back from Barcelona. Uh, it was nice to get a, a little bit of sunshine. I went to the Philips TP Vision launch for the OLED Plus and 908 Ambulate TV. Um, it might not be well known, but uh, Philips are now a sponsor of TP Vision and are a sponsor of Barcelona Football Club. Uh, so that was one of the reasons why it was in Barcelona. Uh, we did go to Camp Nou, um, or what? is Camp New at the minute because obviously they're demolishing the stadium and rebuilding it on the same plot. So that was all interesting. We'll get into the TV and what I saw there. And of course, Danny, uh, his latest updates for the TV. Um, we'll get through all of that. Ed's going to run through the latest hi-fi news, as he always does, as well as uh, a product review. And we're also going to be talking about the pros and cons of objective uh, measurements versus subjective listening uh, when it comes to hi-fi. And I guess we'll be touching on the TV side of things as well, because we do a lot of objective testing there. Uh, so why is that the case uh, with TV and not the case with audio? We're going to get into that tonight. Uh, obviously, the uh, the chat window is open. We're live on YouTube right now. So if you do have questions uh, on any of these subjects, then get them in now and uh, we will answer them as we go along. And obviously, the chat is, uh, is on a slow mode, so you need to get the question in nice and uh, before it turns up there so we can see it. So if you've got questions, get them in now. Uh, we've also got the usual TV, home cinema and hi-fi news from Ian as well. Uh, Ian's going to be updating us on that. And there was a small matter of a new uh, iPhone launched uh, last mm -hmm. week. So we'll uh, we'll briefly touch on that as well as we go on. But that's all a little bit for later. Um, yeah, chat window's open. And of course, the vast majority of you uh, you listen to the audio only version. Uh, so how do you get your questions in and get them answered? Well, if you head to AV forums, uh, go to the forum list right down the bottom, you'll see the AV forums podcast forum. Go in there, uh, find the thread for this podcast. So it will be the AV forums podcast for the 25th of September uh, and add your question into the thread there. And Andy uh, looks through those uh, regularly and he will pick the questions out. He adds them to the running order and we then tell you. Uh, mm. what we think of your comments and so on. And that's exactly what we're going to do uh, right now. Um, first of all, there's two questions came on on the chat very quickly. So uh, Audi said, please review the Panasonic MX950. Uh, the request has gone in. I uh, believe I have a sample coming at some point in the near future. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, they need to pick up the 2000 and swap it over. That's yet to happen, but uh, hopefully that'll happen soon. Gareth Little says, general question, you often talk about TV image processing being better with different brands, etc., and how new silicon offers better processing. But the first thing you always recommend is going into the settings and turning everything off. Um, can you discuss this contradiction? Well, uh, it's not really a contradiction because there's certain um, things that the TV should do through its processing and the silicon. And then there's all the enhancements that manufacturers like to do. I say manufacturers, it, it's mainly the marketing departments of these uh, uh, manufacturers because they have to sell you a new TV every year. So they have to come up with uh, image 2000 processing and super whatever it is this week um, and so on. And it's all marketing terms and so on. But the important bit in the reviews and the bit that we spend a lot of time on is the stuff that's the bread and butter, the things that the TV should do and what's required processing to do that. So motion reproduction, uh, and it's important to say reproduction because it has to reproduce the motion of the content that it's showing you. So if it's 24 frames per second, then it has to show you that correctly. Um, so in a, a 60 hertz uh, TV, for example, uh, it would apply 3-2 pull down. Um, on a 120 hertz TV, it'd apply 5.5 five pull down. So it shows you the correct number of frames uh, one after the other, not repeating too many frames. So three, three, two repeats frames, you will see a bit of judder. 5.5, five, you won't see as much telecynic judder. Um, that's essential. Uh, all TVs have to do that. Manufacturers do approach it slightly differently um, from one another. So those uh, are important and they need to be discussed. Other things uh, that are important is upscaling. So we've all got 4K TVs now. Some of us have 8K TVs, um, but the vast majority of the content you watch at the moment will either be standard definition uh, 576i or it'll be 1080i uh, 
uh, broadcast if it's an HD channel, uh, that needs to be upscaled to the 4K res of the panel and so on. And again, this is processing that TV must be able to do. And again, manufacturers approach the problem slightly differently. So uh, when we say Sony has really good motion processing and upscaling, um, that's what we mean by that. Panasonic have good upscaling. That's what we're talking about. Um, we're not telling you to switch those things off because you can't switch those things off. The things that we're telling you to switch off are things like noise reduction, MPEG noise reduction, um, gradation, uh, motion smoothing, all those kind of things. Um, that's what manipulates the image. That's what changes the image. So noise reduction, normally uh, what it tries to do is clean up the image. But when it's clean up the image, it applies a filter and, and that takes away some of the fine detail. So what's the point of you having a 4K TV and watching 4K content if you're then applying uh, something that's then going to scrub detail away? Uh, so those are the things that we tell you to switch off. So hopefully that explains why there's not a contradiction there. But I can see where the confusion lies. Um, and these are things that we do try and point out. And if you look at our reviews, you'll see that they are structured. All the reviews are the same. They cover each section uh, one after the other. So we do go into picture processing. And we explain what it is that we've been testing and how it performs. Things like what you say you believe Philips lean more that way in your question. Something we're going to get onto a little bit uh, later in the podcast. I'm not going to cover it right now. But Danny Tack um, is the picture guru at Philips. And myself and Danny normally bang heads uh, in a friendly manner we both get on really well but um his philosophy and my philosophy when it comes to image quality is different we'll cover that a little bit later but hopefully that answers that question and then we've got a uh, general um av forums member to Narmi. do you want to handle this one um ed go on then let's have a look at this yeah uh, because this was the subject we were on about on the last yes. podcast, which is manufacturers updating their kit every year yes um with regards to the hardware debate, perhaps there is a need for EU regulations about the manner to, matter to reduce waste, etc. Is it being implemented with uh, phone USB connections? Yes, it is. However, I can see it being driven by the AV industry at present for financial reasons in particular. It's one of the reasons why I bought a NAD T778 with the module approach. Now, that is what well, you don't have to play this game. This is the most important part. Yeah. Even with AV, you can step to one side. I'm... Um, intrinsically suspicious of regulating something like this into being I, I i stand by my comments last podcast i genuinely think that if one manufacturer had the gumption to do it actually everyone else would follow with open arms skipping towards the object the task of not having to repeat um update these things on an annual basis i don't think it's going to need the state to get involved i think it will happen organically and i think it will happen soon um but nevertheless there are times and places for a bit of state state intervention you know uh, energy efficiency product safety i'm in two minds about the whole business of thrashing apple into using usb connections i mean i I, I, I don't think it would. I do, I do not believe that people's existence will be materially changed by making them do this. But again, we'll cover this when we talk about the iPhone a bit later on. It does mean for the first time in a long, long time, I'd consider um, buying an iPhone. Mm. Um, I can stay with this, Phil, because I've got the next question yeah, you as have, well. Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, and this one's an absolute doozy. I can't believe I'm going to say this one online. Uh, right, uh, Modib asks, I would be interested in knowing how to play Cobuzz in 5.1. I can't seem to cast from iPad to Apple TV in 5.1, and there's no native Cobuzz app on the Apple TV. And you're absolutely right. So I asked Cobuzz. Do you know what Cobuzz told me? You can't. You can't. Well, <laughs> you can, but you can't. There's no piece of native Cobuzz embedded app hardware that can do this. If you are a Rune subscriber, and you have a rune like a rune box so you're not running rune on a pc or mac you're running it on a dedicated rune os nook like a, a like a nucleus or one that you've built yourself these can have hdmi outputs and these can output multi-channel so the irony is i could play this file in 5.1 because i've got a rune nucleus what i don't have is five speakers um, so yes, it seems like a bit of an oversight. Um, I'm at pains to stress I, that was usefully honest um, uh, feedback when I asked about that. I think this is something that's in the process of being create up updated and, and sorted out in at the moment. 
So uh, hopefully it's a case of watch this space and um, and and the the hardware and and playback is going to catch up with the the formats being available. Excellent. Okay. Uh, moving on swiftly, Pulse One made a suggestion uh, regarding home AV. He said, "Can I request that AV forums include?" In a future podcast, uh, speakers, subwoofer, soundbar choices, and optimum placement for multi-channel surround, etc., for a dedicated room or living room media room setting. And is there more speaker, subwoofer, soundbar choices available nowadays than ever before? Uh, so, yeah, I think this is one probably for a whole podcast. To be honest, um, mm. it's certainly something that we will look at. There's so much to go through, um, but it is a very uh, valid question that you ask there. Um, and yes, uh, valuable feedback. We we do take it on board. So um, yeah, that's probably a podcast on its own. Uh, we'll certainly look at that. We'll get the, the the right members of the team on and we'll, we'll see about doing something about that in the near future. So thanks for that suggestion, Pulse One. And if you do have any suggestions about the podcasts in general, uh, do you enjoy the movies podcast? What elements of the podcast do you enjoy? Is AV more your thing? Is hardware more your thing? Um, then send us your, your feedback in because we're getting towards the end of the year and we will be planning for the year ahead um, that's coming. So um, we might change things around. Um, and if you guys want particular things mentioned or you like certain areas of the podcast and maybe dislike others, then let us know. It's all valuable. It, it's all useful information. And then Silverback 007 asks, TV-wise, is the Sony A95K still the TV to beat in 2023? Thanks. No. Yeah, they, they pretty simple. Know. And I th I'm pretty sure we answered that at the end of the last podcast as well. Probably. probably. Um, so hopefully uh, I'm, I'm not going to be you know, as rude as that. I will go into the reasons as to why. Uh, but you'll have, need to listen on to the podcast and listen in a little bit uh, later in the podcast. And I will come back to that because um, things have changed just in the space of a year. Things have changed and um, the balance of the force has been uh, changed significantly when it comes to TVs this year with different technologies and a bit of competition. It's, it's kind of changed things around. So we'll come back to that one. Uh, there was also a, a question about the, uh, the RX A4A AVR, um, saying that the, uh, the best UK advertised price from authorised dealer was 1199 quid, as well as uh, Yamaha offering a 130 pound cashback. Uh, so that was a, an amplifier that was reviewed last podcast. Martin covered that on the last podcast. So yes, there is deals on at the minute. If you're interested in story from Yamaha, um, you can pick it up for about 1195 quid. Um, and it does look like Yamaha are adding on a cashback offer as well. Um, so there's £85 back on the A2A. Uh, 130 on the A4A and 170 on the A6A and 220 on the top of the end, uh, top line uh, A8A. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll put those links uh, in the forum for you so you can go and follow them if you're interested. Right. Um, so there's not a lot of us here tonight, but we uh, we have been out and about and doing, well, I'm, I'm saying, me and Ed have probably been out and about and doing things. What have you been up to, Ian? I've been staying in quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, well, I haven't really had much scope to get out and about. Um, and what little moments of sort of free time I have had have mostly been involved in playing Starfield uh, on the Xbox. <laughs> um, if people are curious, there is a PC review up on the website now for a more detailed response. But yeah, I, I'm I'm quite liking it. It's the kind of game that you can kind of drop in and out of uh, at times time. It's not as good as I thought, or at least it's not kind of as immersive as I hoped it would be. It's kind of a bit bitty and a bit... It's all it's that kind of game which tells you to go from point A to point B. You get to point B, it's just go to point C. Point C sends you back to point A. Point A sends you to point... And so on. And it's a lot of kind of faffing about. So I'm still trying to get to, to grips with it. But yeah, it's it's good fun. But if you want a more detailed analysis, there is a write-up uh, on the, the website now. Hasn't um, the multiplayer bit been ruined by someone discovering online that um, the way that the targeting systems work targets the central mass of the ship? So you can now wander around in something that looks like a child science project. So long as it's got a hole in the middle, you're essentially invulnerable because all of the weapons just pass through the gap in the middle and don't cause your ship any damage. Yeah, it, it's basically the way that the targeting system works is that, yeah, it, it kind of focuses on something you figured out. Basically, you build a giant donut. <laughs> of sorts and people that shoot at you will all everything will go through the middle of your spaceship so i mean that's but that's part of the fun of the game is that it lets you build any ship you like it's got like a uh basically a ship creation system where you can i mean you can see some of the designs online people are building you know authentic recreations of the millennium falcon people are building giant ducks in space you know whatever you want to you can kind of put out there so yeah there's it's especially on the pc version where there's mods for just about everything 
basically yeah. people will always find a way to break video games or to kind of embellish them in weird and wonderful ways so i i yeah, i don't doubt that there's almost nothing in starfield that people haven't toyed with in one respect or another uh, but yeah it's but it's good fun i've been enjoying it good excellent uh i've been away on holiday the last week we went up to isle of sky it rained all week end well, not of, all week of, week. you've managed to take photos where it appears yeah, was, not to be raining the, the, there was some periods of sunshine but generally the, the rain kind of spoiled plain for most of the week i mean sky is spectacular no matter you know what the weather's like and what it's doing and you know changes from one minute to the other but we did have a very dreak uh week yeah, to be honest so um but yeah uh, it, we got away we uh we had three dogs with us uh four adults um big cottage that we're staying right next to a lock um just up the main road great venue nice place to stay the sky's beautiful but yeah it, it was kind of wet most of the week um so anyway Back and refreshed, as they say. Ed, what have you been up to? I went to Berlin, uh, oh, and did, did uh, I had uh, quite a lot of sun. So, you know, there. That's where you should have gone, <laughs> mate. Uh, no, I went to see a German hi-fi company called Burmester. Um, now, I actually intend to write this up a little bit uh, later on, so I won't go into unnecessary detail. But suffice to say, Burmester makes extremely expensive hi-fi. Um, they, uh, whilst we were there, said with a straight face, it is impossible for them to build product to their standards in Berlin, where they're based, for less than 10,000 euros a box. And having seen how they build stuff, uh, I mean, you could argue that they might be able to shave a little bit off if they weren't uh, quite so obsessive compulsive. These are usually um, where people might be uh, familiar with the name that I'm not in a high fight, Car Audio. Um, exactly. The biggest systems like Rolls Royce and Porsche and so on. Well, exactly. Essentially, Burmester worked out some time ago that they needed to get some new people through the door. Um, and and they have basically, we came along to see both how they were doing that and what the, the repercussions of them doing that were. And it's genuinely interesting. It's one of the most positive visits I've had to a high-end audio company in a very long time because it was... Uh, a company with a strategy which was a bit more advanced than try to retire before your last customers die. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I, I was very, very heartened. And I have to say, car audio, uh, it's not really my thing, but, um, yeah, they sound tremendous. And uh, any company that picks me up from the airport in a Maybach, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I've got time oh, for that. Maybe. You know, there there are worse ways to be collected from the airport. So, no, that was, that was mainly what I've been up to. Um Otherwise, I'm, I have been plowing I'm assuming through. plenty of German beers were consumed. Well, I mean, they were determined for me to consume cocktails. Uh, they, you know, they picked a wine list with the meal and all sorts of things. So, I no, I drank beer because mm -hmm. I know what happens when I drink beer. And it's a fairly consistent and repeatable sort of <laughs> undertaking. But nevertheless, um, yeah, that was, yeah, it was, it was a really, really good trip. Ironically, it's the first time I've been abroad since COVID. Um, really? Okay. And yeah, I've been that reclusive. And at the very least, I broke myself back in with a really, really well organized and genuinely interesting trip. So that was all good. Otherwise, I've been plowing through a mountain of stuff here uh, for various people, AV forums being highly among them. Um, and uh, it's the end of September, so I've started making soup again. So, you know, obviously, yeah, same here. it's like a like an Attenborough migrationary thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I was drying laundry out on the line, but it, today it felt like time to make soup, so I did. So, yeah, yeah that's that's what I've been up to. Um, I'm also attending, just, just as a, a point of admin, I'm attending the Hi-Fi News show at Ascot this weekend, but I'm afraid I'm attending on the Friday, which is the press day, hopefully to get at least fragmentary bits of show report up whilst the show's still open so you can make a decision based on whether you uh you feel that that's something that you want to go and have a look at um so i don't think i'm going to see many of you there but i am going and we're going to see what there is at um what is a creditable attempt to try to make a national hi-fi show so yeah we'll uh, we'll see how that goes as well well we always support that kind of thing it's a mm. it's a dying art um hi-fi shows audio shows av shows um we used to have lots of them. We have very little now. Yes. Um, in fact, I think there's just Bristol show really in this one. So there's not. Well, there's, there's, I think there's one other. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some yeah. more regional sort of things going on. But this mm. is, the, in terms of the way that this is laid out, in terms of where it is and things like that, um, you know, an effort is being made to actually give it a bit of clout. So 
that yeah. very much. I mean, it was supposed to happen last year, but then um, obviously uh, the Queen died. Uh, so uh, it's been a hiatus since COVID, and I'm I'm just very very hopeful that it um, that it delivers, and you know, it's something worth worth repeating. So yeah. I'll be going along to that and seeing how we get on. Excellent, good stuff. Uh, right, so let's move on. Current competitions, we got quite a bit to win, Ian. Um, why don't you tell us all about it? Good thing. Uh, all these competitions are open to AV4 as usual. Uh, and kicking off with one which is uh, ending at the end of this week. So if you're not listening to this live, you might need to move quite quickly. You can win £500 to spend with MPB, which is the platform for selling and trading used photo and videographic equipment. Uh, that closes on at 11.59 on Friday, the 29th of September. So like I say, if you're not listening to it live, uh, you might need to move quickly to avoid disappointment. Um, if you do miss out, there's plenty more that you can turn your attention to, starting with uh, a partnership with Peter Tyson that we've done, where you can win a pair of Bowers & Wilkins 607 S3 bookshelf speakers, uh, along with an Audio Quest Rocket 11 speaker cable, worth a combined total of £919. You've got until Thursday the 19th of October to get your name in the hat for that one. Uh, and we've also teamed up with uh, AV.com uh, to let people win a monitor audio and Roxanne Hi-Fi system worth £2,468. Uh, that includes a pair of monitor audio bronze 500 floor standing speakers, uh, a Roxana Tessa integrated amplifier and a visual cable pack. Uh, uh, as with the Bowers and Wilkins competition, you've got until Thursday the 19th of October to get your name in the hat for that one. And that adds up to a combined prize pool worth nearly £4,000. So definitely worth chancing your arm if you're fancy yeah. getting mm -hmm. your hands definitely. on some good kit. Excellent. And uh, also there, there are disc competitions running at the moment, which you may already see uh, if you're watching live on the on the pictures there. Uh, so uh, AV Forums members, again, Chelsea Detective, Midsummer Murders, Succession, Stephen King, on-screen documentary. Uh, they're all available, three of those on, on, on retro DVD, uh, one on Blu-ray. Uh, exclusive offers to patrons include uh, the modern horror classic It Follows on limited edition 4K. Uh, UHD, uh, David Cronenberg's uh, Crime of the Future Limited Edition, Fast X, Cutthroat Island, uh, Wes Anderson's Asteroid City, and a whole host of others uh, are available uh, for you to go and win. So head over to avforums.com competitions, uh, and you can all enter apart from me. Uh, yeah. So there you go. That's the admin sorted out. That's the competitions. Uh, new patrons, uh, Mazon27091, thank you very much for your support. Uh, everyone that's a patron uh, of this channel, we do appreciate your support. Um, thank you very much. We will hopefully one day produce uh, an adequate podcast. I think it's striving a inexorably yeah. towards adequacy. Yeah. I, yes. I think a solid five out of 10. Yeah. Um, and and we'd be happy, I think. Right. Mm. Anyway, let's get on with the show. So, like I alluded to uh, right at the start of the podcast, I was away uh, in Barcelona uh, for the Philips launch, uh, which was actually two weeks ago now. It, it time flown by. I actually got back from that trip, unpacked my bag, and then packed my bag again, and then away on holiday. So, uh, so yeah, and edit a video and publish it at the same time. So, it was a lot on. Uh, but, Ian, um, why don't you give us the highlights in terms of the news, and then I'll get stuck in about what I actually saw when I was there. Yeah, basically just to help out with a, a bit of the admin, uh, really. But Philips has uh, confirmed pricing and launch window for the uh, OLED Plus 908 Ambulite TV in the UK. Uh, set to launch in the middle of October. Um, as people might be aware, it'll be available in 55, 65 and 77 inch sizes. Uh, and those will be priced in the UK at £2,999, £3,499 and £4,999 respectively. Uh, as many people will be aware, 908 sees the introduction of the micro lens array layer, along with the brightness boosting algorithm to push it up to a peak output of 2,100 nits. Uh, also comes the next gen Ambulite system, backed up with the new seventh gen P5 AI processor and a 3.1 channel powers and Wilkins sound system. Uh, to couple with that, uh, the OLED 808 um, is also on the way, set to come out in a, within the same sort of mid October window. Uh, it was pushed back a little bit, I think, from the uh, planned August release because there might have been some issues with getting Freeview Play added uh, to the new Google TV setup. Uh, but Philip seems confident enough that it, that will be added sooner rather than later. We didn't want to hold back the TVs any longer for a good reason, I suspect. Uh, the 808 uh, will be available in 42 to 77 inch sizes with prices starting at £1,400, going up to £3,800 for that 77, 77 inch version. Um, and from what I, I assume we're about to hear, we are expecting good things. 
Uh, yeah, so um, it was the 13th that was over there um, for their launch event. So um, basically the 908, the OLED Plus 908, uh, is Philips taking on um, LG Display's MLE panel. So Panasonic have, have launched their version already. Uh, we've already reviewed that one. This one uh, also has the same panel, but obviously with Philips P5 processor um, on the back there. So this is uh, a single processor. It's not a dual chip processor that Philips normally do. Um, so the the normal big flagship TV with a dual processor, this usually the separate Bowers and Wilkins speaker as a stand and so on. Uh, the 937 was the last one. It, the, there's not one this year. Um, and the simple reason for that is that these are using the new Pentonic chips um, that have come out from MediaTek. So both the, the 808 and the 908. Uh, and the issue is that there was so much development work needed with this new silicon to put the P5 processing on top of that. Um, there wasn't enough time for Danny to do the dual processor version. Um, so this year, the 908 is the flagship TV, and it's a beautiful looking TV. Um, it harks back to the 903, which was Philips' first TV with Bowers and Wilkins. It was the first one that where they had the uh, the integrated soundbar. Um, and uh, this harks back to that design. It's a nice one uh, purpose chassis with the soundbar at the bottom. 3.1, as Ian said, Bowers and Wilkins designed. Um, Obviously, they've had more time with this TV to design the enclosures and speaker uh, enclosures in terms of dampening and that kind of thing, uh, the subwoofers as well. Um, so audio-wise, it's sorted. It's a 3.1 system, but Dolby Atmos in there as well. Um, a couple of other things that, that, uh, that just look nice. The design is lovely. There's a new remote control. And you might think, well, what's what's the point? Of new, why, why is that spent? Well, have you ever seen a Philips or Philips remote control? They're massive. And they've got every button under the sun. They used to have a QWERTY keyboard on the back. Um, and then the front side was just pull the buttons. Um, so it has been really pared back and simplified. And uh, what normally made the, these remotes so big was the number keys. You know, your one to nine and zero and your plus and minus keys and your hashtag and all the rest of it. That's what made up the most the, the space. With this new slimline small remote control, you press one button and it changes the menu buttons and the directional keys into number keys by pressing this one button. It lights up, um, which are really clever design. Really, uh, some thoughts got into that. So that's quite nifty. Like Ian said, 55, 65, 77 inch screen sizes. And as mentioned, MLE technology. So what is MLE? Micro lens array. Uh, so basically, it, it's billions of little um, lenses that go over the top of the pixel. And what it does in the basic terms is it redirects redirects light that's normally lost inside the panel. Um, so light travels all over the place and, and only a certain percentage actually comes out towards the viewer. What these little lenses do is, is it directs that light out of the panel, um, which significantly boosts brightness. Um, so Philips are claiming 2,100 nits. Uh, that is in the crystal clear, i.e. vivid mode on a 3% window. Um, so in D65 white point uh, for accuracy with HDR content, you're probably going to be around about 1400 nits. Um, that's the that's the actual figure that um, you know it's too conservative for a launch event. But, you know you want to bang on about the 2100 nits. That is in Philips version of of uh, vivid mode, which they call crystal clear. And as we've seen from their shootouts in the past, if you want a TV, if you're going to buy a TV and you want a vivid mode, it's the most dialed back, natural looking vivid mode. And I'm being kind here because uh, we all hate vivid modes around here. But Philips have actually made an effort with theirs. So the processing's good. The colors are not overly garish. They are bright. Um, but they try and bring out a bit more detail, a bit more shadow detail and not you know burn your retinas basically um, with their vivid mode. So that's what Danny Tack does with, with the P5 processor. It has all sorts of gradation, um, noise reduction, all that kind of thing in, in that mode. And of course, smooth motion. If that's your thing, then great. You know, it, it'll do that. And like I say, it's one of the best TVs on the market for that kind of image, if that's your, your cup of tea. If you want accuracy, it will do accuracy. But like I say, 1400 nits is probably my guess uh, based on what the Panasonic's done this year with the same panel and their process and what the LG G3 uh, is capable of um, at the minute. Um, MLE is great. The Meta Booster, uh, the Meta Brightness Booster, 
lot of names to get through here. Um, again, it just uses the processing. It's an algorithm. It's designed to get uh, the most brightness out of the panel. Um, and it was interesting. We had some side by side stuff. Again, it was in vivid mode or you know, crystal clear mode. Um, I'm not going to base any opinion on it. Um, these are the types of demos where you just bite, bite you bite your tongue. Um, they, they, they want to demonstrate the TV in a certain way, and that's how they're going to do it. We'll do it properly in the accurate modes when we get them in for review, and we'll do the side by sides. But it was interesting to see, you know, the LG G3, the OLED Plus 908 from Philips and Samsung's S95C um, next to each other, um, and, you know, what Philips thought they brought to the table in terms of picture quality and so on. So, um, so yeah, interesting stuff. We'll get into it in a lot more detail when we get the TV soon. I'm, I'm expecting a review sample um, pretty soon. So the seventh generation P5 chip as well. Um, there wasn't any um, you know, major uh, uh, big uh, updates there other than you know the brightness booster, the meta brightness booster to go along with the MLA panel. Um, and the Philips processing is is very, very good um, at the best of times. So, uh, so yeah, it, it was an interesting event. Like I say, TP Vision uh, Philips are now sponsoring Barcelona. They're a, a she, uh, shirt sleeve sponsor. Um, so we were at Camp New. We had a look around the museum there, which is always great to see. Camp New is obviously being um, rebuilt at the moment. Um, so it's going from 100 and odd thousand to 100, I think it said 150,000. Uh, spectators so at the minute they've had to go to uh, the other stadium in the city um, which is only 53,000 so it was interesting that a lot of those season ticket holders have had to give up their seats for one season while they while they build this new stadium how they're going to get it finished for the start of next season I have no idea because it just looked like um, a building site basically but there you go um, so yeah, it was interesting. Interesting to see the TV. Like I say, uh, that is coming very soon for review. If you want a little bit more detail uh, with Danny, with Danny Tack, um, there is a video. Um, Stu's playing that at the minute. If you're watching on YouTube, um, once you've finished with the podcast, you go and search out the video uh, where I did quickly interview uh, Danny. It was a, a feature-packed event. Um, lots of journalist wanting time with uh, with Danny. So, but I managed to get six minutes of his time. Um, and got him on video. And there's also clips of the new remote control and everything um, in there. Uh, but yeah, it looks like a very promising TV um, and uh, lots of features on there that you would expect to see. Uh, and again, the uh, gaming side of things, Ian, have, they've been looking at that. They've taken on the feedback as well. So you now get 4K 120, uh, two HDMI 2.1 inputs, 48 gigabits per second, obviously with a new uh, Pentonic chip. And of course, the Pentonic chip adds uh, quite a few other features, which we'll, we're waiting to see if Philips are going to take advantage of those as well um, when I get my hands on there. But the, there is FreeSync Premium G-Sync uh, compatibility and so on there as well. So um, obviously aiming at the gamers. And of course, the big uh, selling point with a Philips TV is Ambulite. Um, people might think it's a gimmick. If you go on the follow video mode, which basically the lights follow what's ever on screen. So if you've got blue at the right side of the screen, then you get blue on the wall behind it and so on, and it constantly changes and so on. Um, that is gimmicky. Some people love it uh, and just have the TV switched on that. Um, but the the big advantage here for uh, AV Forums members and audience uh, like you lot is obviously bias lighting. Um, to be fair, a... I have seen... Depending on in very very specific examples, the follow color thing actually doesn't look too shabby. It's you know it's gimmicky. It's not how to do it. If you're going to do it, it will cause fatigue quite quickly. Mm. But yes, it's it's not over the top. It adds a little bit of mesh. And where it works is with gaming because obviously yeah, that's it, it adds that that little bit more to your peripheral vision and and adds a little bit more color and so on. Uh, but where this really does work is used as a bias light. It has a D65 ISF mode in there. You can actually calibrate it as well um, if you want to go that far. Uh, you know, take a measurement of the, the wall color behind the TV and then, um, you know, do an offset within Kalman and you can cal actually calibrate the light so it is D65 white. Why is that important? Well, obviously I've just mentioned eye fatigue. Now, you might not realize it, but watching TV, because you, you're going from bright scenes to dark scenes and from dark scenes to bright scenes and so on, um, then obviously you, your eyes is opening and closing and opening. And it's all subconscious. But if you're watching the TV in a pitch black room, even an OLED TV in a pitch black room, um, the change in the brightness is affecting your eye and that causes tiredness. A bias light 
it basically adds a little bit of light behind the TV. It's not bright, um, but it's there just to keep the eye at a certain state and it reduces tiredness. And if you look at any professional color grading suite or editing suite um, in Hollywood or in the UK or in a TV studio, um, all the grading monitors and all the client monitors, they all have a bias light behind them because these guys are sitting there for eight hour shifts. They're watching a screen. Uh, the last thing they want is eye fatigue and getting something looking uh, wrong at the end of the day. So yeah, it's a great feature and it's only on Philips TV. So, so there you go. That was the OLED 908. That was the launch event that I was lucky enough to attend. And thanks to Philips for uh, inviting me out there to have a look at that. Um, all the usual faces were there as well. So it was good to catch up with, with everybody else uh, out there in the industry. And um, yeah, and the 808 as well. Uh, has been launched or will be launched this month. So expecting both of those in for review uh, very soon. So uh, what else is counted for review? Well, TCL uh, C745 TV is uh, is going to hit the ten test bench next. Get my words right. right. Still got the Hisense U8K there. I'm just filming that at the minute. Um, should be finished with that tomorrow. Uh, also got Sony TVs incoming. So the A95L, I'm just waiting on um, that turning up. Um, I've been promised a uh, fast delivery on that one. So hopefully that will land at some point this week. And also uh, somebody mentioned it earlier on, but I am expecting the MZ1500 and the MX950 from Panasonic as well. And then I think we've covered most of the major screens at that point, uh, mm. which is good because we've got our Editor's Choice Awards coming up next month or, or the end of next month. So, uh, so yeah, we should have all of that through uh, for then. But anyway, that's it for the TV side of things. Uh, Home AV is next or maybe if you'd like to support the av forums podcast on a regular basis then why not become a patron head over to patreon.com forward slash av forums to sign up you can also make a one-off donation through the super chat or via streamlabs.com forward slash av forums all donations help us to improve the website and the podcasts thank you to all our supporters Right, um, Home AV side of things. Um, not a lot to get through in terms of reviews, but we do have some new stories. And of course, there was the big Apple launch. We'll come to Apple in a little while. But first, um, Ian, what's happening in the world of Home AV? Uh, yeah, just a couple of quick stories to get through. Um, first of all, Rook uh, is launched, or is set to launch its first ever subwoofer in the form of the RS1. It comes priced at £349. It's a relatively simple classic cube design with a 6.7 inch long throw active driver uh, and a 100 watt class D amplifier uh, designed to sit primarily alongside Roark's own MR1 Bluetooth speakers or as part of his uh, R3S music system just to make for a decent and presumably not overly expensive TV hi-fi or gaming setup. So it should be quite a nice addition to their lineup. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, I have actually asked for, I've been trying to chase a couple of review samples off um, uh, off the remark. It, they're, they're good at the news stories. They're less keen on you actually getting your hands on the product. So we'll see if we can see if I can correct that. But um, it's less the subwoofer than the speaker that they announced before that. That's extremely technically interesting. And I'd really like to have a go on it. But as yet, I'm still on, still in the waiting list for that one. Okay, but if we do get one, we... Uh, oh, we'll God, I'll be in, we'll in there as it, like yeah. a tramp with a bag of chips, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else you... Yeah, uh, BenQ uh, has announced three new 4K HDR additions to its X series uh, of what it calls its immersive gaming projectors lineup. Uh, top in the list with a £2,099 price tag is the new flagship model, the X31000, not 3100i rather, uh, which lays claim to a peak brightness of up to 3,300 ANSI lumens, although quite how that translates into everyday gaming sessions remains to be seen. Uh, there's a more compact alternative in the X500i, which is priced at £1,499, uh, which goes up to 2,200 lumens. While there's also uh, a new X300G portable alternative, likely to be around the £1,599 mark, uh, which boasts a uh, peak brightness of 2,000 lumens. All three models are due in mid-October, uh, come with BenQ's own cinematic colour and cinematic sound technologies. Uh, and as you might expect from a gaming projector, they come with a bunch of very gamer-friendly features, uh, including, uh, including low input lag. Uh, there's an auto game mode, there's a setting exchange system to help you adapt uh, whatever game you're playing to obviously match the best possible uh, image on screen. And there's also an Android TV set up with Netflix built in for your wider home entertainment needs. So it should be three good options uh, to come quite soon from BenQ if you're into gaming and like projectors. 
Yeah, I, I do like uh, the BenQ projectors. I've had um, all three of the uh, the home cinema and home entertainment models through now. Um, actually, my review of the 4000 just went up um, last week there. Um, cracking projector. Uh, these all look pretty good as well. I mean, the four LED um, model is probably the, the one to look out for uh, in terms of the gaming side of things. Um, but yeah, uh, if we have time before the end of the year and we can slot these in or at least slot one of them in, I'll certainly be looking at one of those um, a little bit later on. So um, yeah, good lineup there and um, the nine beats gaming on a big screen here, basically. Um, if you want that I'd love immersion, to have space to try it out. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, if you've got the immersion, that jet washing experience. As ah, far just imagine as it. Oh, just imagine. Contain it. yourself. <laughs> well, well, he's just a really immersive. <laughs> it would be beautiful. <laughs> oh, I've got pictures of you with the waterproofs on in the wellies, and it'll yeah. be like the guys that play football manager and wear a suit when they get to the cup final. It'll be that kind of chew gum. <laughs> I, I, I remember back with the old um, Jeff Cram and Formula One simulator. I knew someone that decided to really up the the you know realism as a relative term on a platform that age, but they essentially wound an enormous speaker up behind their head to replicate the engine, um, which was extremely successful in so far as it's very immersive, but it actually did quite significantly impinge on their hearing after they'd done it for an entire season. So yeah, you know, I urge caution with the uh, with the, uh, the the the, <laughs> the um, cosplay element of this. Yeah. Okay, I guess we need to talk about Apple because uh, they had the big launch um, earlier, and uh, the new iPhones, iPhone 15. Well, we knew we knew they were coming. Uh, so our very own Dave Feeling was actually out uh, in Cupertino and uh, was at the event and managed to get hands on with the phones, um, and he did a report from us for us on the actual evening of the event. So if you haven't seen that, you can go and see uh, mm. uh, David's uh, coverage of that. And thank uh, thank you very much, David, for that. It, interesting to see the phones. Um, and yeah, it, it, I haven't spent too much time delving into them because basically I can't afford one at the minute. I'd love to have a, a new one. I've, I've got a 12 Pro, which is still holding up quite well and you know, battery wise and so on. It's still uh, it's about 77% gradation on it so um or degradation sorry so it, it's still uh it's still got life in it. it needs recharging every day but um i quite fancy the 15 uh ed and there's quite a, a few nice little features including the uh the five times uh zoom which oh they've done some useful zoom things on the, i think on the i think their implementation of the USB-C on the non-pro is unforgivably lax i mean essentially it's still a usb2 device and we've had that as a standard for 20 years to actually have decent usb speeds you need to, to, to go for the pro um and i i do hope that that is something that is corrected reasonably reasonably promptly um but no from my perspective i've liked iPhones for years and years and years, but the moment that my iPads, of which you know I've had one of those on the go ever since I started doing the podcast, uh, I think you break down to being either a big phone, um, sensible laptop person, or like me, you break it over three things. So I have a, a large and fairly importable laptop, a phone that isn't that large, and an iPad, which acts as the middle category thing. Now, since they started turning up the USB C. I just find it preposterous that I could go to Berlin on Monday, pack a single charger to pa charge my uh, Oppo Android phone, my iPad Pro, and a pair of wireless headphones. And if I'd introduced uh, an iPhone into that mix until this one came along, I'd have needed to have a separate cable mm -hmm. for that. And I just yeah. consider that. To, I mean, whilst I firmly believe that Steve Jobs would have solved this problem by never introducing USB-C <laughs> on anything... Mm -hmm. It, it, it just it just felt unforgivably lax and this yeah. is you know from my you know reactionary perspective this is a very useful step forward although i resent if i went from my standard uh, existing android phone to an iphone 15 if i went to a non-pro one things that i take for granted that the android phone can do over USB C, the non-pro iphone is going to be significantly slower and more impaired at doing yeah. it but I, I'm with you on that one. It's infuriating because I, I have got a, a MacBook Pro. It's the M1 Max. Uh, it's got three USB-Cs and the MagSafe charger. I've got iPad Pro, USB-C. Yeah. Yeah. The iPhone, like you say, completely different. Like, 
on that. So parking to go on a trip, uh, that's I could get away with charging USB C on the laptop, but you end up with three chargers, mm. taking three chargers with you just to keep the devices charged. It's, if they're all yeah. USB C, you just need the one cable. No, exactly. And I'm pleased that, you know, okay, they've taken, it's taken state intervention to it. I'm pleased it's happened. Uh, I'm not replacing my phone this year. Um, uh, I'm at this laptop change, actually. And ironically, I might be going for MacBook Pro for that. Um, but uh, I know that means they're back on the radar. I could end up being back in an entirely Apple ecosystem. We'll see how things go. Um, I, I just hope that they are encouraged to be a little bit more enthusiastic about the USB standard um, on the non-pro models. I think, I mean, given that the USB-C implementation on the pro, uh, I don't know if you've, I, as far as I'm concerned, Phil, it's bulletproof, absolutely superb. doesn't matter what I connect to it, it just works. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and if there's any sign of that being a retrograde step on the phones, I'm not going to be falling over myself to hand them, hand them the money, especially mm -hmm. as I have a device with USB-C on it, which behaves exactly the same as the iPad does. Uh, it's just not made by Apple. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm pleased it's happened. You're absolutely right. The camera stuff looks, looks excellent. Um, but people getting a bit ratty online. Oh, they haven't done much to change the industrial design. No, the industrial design is fine. Going back to what we're talking about, changing your television every year. Uh, if certain things aren't broke, it's mm, a yeah. burning need to fix them. So yeah, you know, I agree with that. I don't uh, Paul, that. Paul Munger in the chat says he's got both uh, got both my new iPhone and watch delivered today. Time to stick the old ones on the classifieds. Um, you might get more money on the classifieds actually because I did the whole um, just went through the Apple Store um, looking at the 15 uh, Pro Max, um, and it says well the trading uh, value up to 750 quid. I thought oh, I'll punch my phone details in. I put the serial number in and so on. And uh, for the for the twelve Pro that I have, they were offering me three hundred quid. So it was still eight hundred odd quid um, to pay yeah. for the new phone. It's just it's, it's too much money. Well, you know, it everything is extremely expensive at the moment, as we know. So, but it's like I mean, in some regards, it works in Apple's advantage. As I say, well, I've used ThinkPads, as you know, for. 20 something years mm -hmm. um to buy basically exactly the same spec as this three-year-old thinkpad that i'm talking to you now so make no incremental advantage other than uh, a small processor boost uh is 650 quid more than i paid three years ago um and yeah. actually against that the apple hardware you know built for the purpose of running osx starts to look more and more tempting so especially as apple has rediscovered that people actually type on keyboards mm -hmm. and uh, has significantly improved those I, i've so, got to say i absolutely love uh this this macbook pro i've had a few now i think this is my fourth or fifth one uh, and, and i just use the laptop now i used to have a an imac desktop and a yeah. laptop um, and I just use the laptop now. It is so quick. It's so fast. It runs everything. Uh, Premiere Pro, I can edit in that. I can ed uh, then color correct in DaVinci Resolve. And if I wanted to, I could be editing on Final Cut as well and um, using Motion or using um, you know, any of the Adobe platforms all at the same time, jumping one to the other and so on. It's bulletproof and the hardware just works. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, my this laptop is 32 gigs of RAM and Lightroom runs as fast on the Pro, iPad Pro, as it does on this laptop. It's yeah. Yeah. It, it, deeply impressive. Um, yeah. And I can yeah. type a review as fast on that iPad as I can on this laptop. So, yeah, um, yeah it's quite deeply impressive. Um, yeah. So, yeah, as I say, I think... I'm guardedly positive. I mean, I know nothing about the watches. You know, I, I like my watches with cogs in. I'm sure yeah. the watch is wonderful. I've, a, um, a, I've, I've, I've got, I think it's a six. And I've no need to update. In fact, I think if I was going to update my smartwatch, I'd go to a Garmin. Um, that's not... I guess, of course, you're a newly active person now, and they're, that's they're not the, because the shears I for that. This is just the, the health stuff on the, the the Apple Watch is not quite as... as good as the Garmin uh, yeah. implementation for running and, and that kind of thing, which is kind of what I, I thought the Apple would do a lot more than it actually does. Maybe it's, maybe I just haven't dug deep enough into it, but, uh, but yeah, the, you know, Michelle uses the, the Garmin and it seems to do a lot more things that I would find mm. useful than, but saying that this has been bulletproof, the, the Apple watch. And like I say, series six, I've, I felt no need to, what are we on to now? Is it nine? I don't know. Ten? As uh, you know, Phil, mine does minutes hours and seconds 
Um, it's brilliant. Yeah, but it's, it's probably still worth a fortune years, though. It won't have depreciated like. Well, this. Had. I mean, there is there's a school of thought that says you, you you can't get you can't get come by the game if you don't play it. But you know, yeah. yeah. So yeah. different. Right. Stuff, different folks. So um, iPhone 15 uh, come back. We might we might all have one next week. Who knows? <laughs> um, Anyway, I think uh, I think that's everything for Home AV. Normally we have reviews. Uh, unfortunately, Doug and, and Martin are not here this week, uh, but we'll be back uh, for the next podcast. We will have those because uh, both of them have been looking at some really cracking products. Um, that we The reviews are up on the site, so go read them. Uh, but definitely stuff that we should be talking about in the next podcast. And of course, Jules will be back hopefully next podcast as well. But um, I'm going to hand over to Ed next for the hi-fi section. If you enjoy the podcast on YouTube, then please like and subscribe. If you're listening to the audio version, then please leave us a rating on your podcast app. We invite you to email questions and feedback to podcast at avforums.com and join in with this episode's discussion thread in the podcasts forum at avforums. Right then, uh, spot a hi-fi to uh, finish things off. Um, uh, in a moment, we're going to talk about... Um, objectivity and subjectivity and i imagine that that um uh, could be it's probably something that's going to generate some comments afterwards we'll see how we go but we've got some new stories to kick off with to begin with um and uh, first up uh we've got more record players in this time from denon yeah it's actually been quite a busy few weeks for <laughs> the turntables i remember i did a new story thing oh we haven't done a story on new turntables for a while so i posted i can't remember which one it was and then there was like four new yeah. out came out within the space of a few days but the one we're focused on now is uh, from Denon because it's announced a new flagship turntable in the form of the DP3000NE. Uh, it's a three-speed direct drive player, boasts new and improved S-shaped tone arms, varying adjustments to help fine tune it. Uh, there's a new motor system to reduce overheating and any subsequent fluctuations. Uh, and there's also support for both MM and MC cartridges. Uh, it's due to launch in October uh, at a not insignificant price of £2,299. Uh, but it could be interesting to see how it shapes up against some of those other uh, sort of higher end turntables. Well, the big one is how the, the thing, jury's still out on uh, whether this is genuinely something that goes toe to toe with Technix or whether it's still a dressed up version of a platform which crops up in lots and lots of different things and does so from a price of a couple of hundred quid and up. And we won't know until we get hands on because the outside is no clue as to what's on the inside. But yes, uh, I have, I've tried to ask for a, a one for review, so we'll see how we get on with that. Um, but it's, it's nice to see other people joining the club, really, isn't it? You know, And mm. um, it's not just limited to, to Denon. Uh, we've, I, I nixed uh, one of Ian's other stories. Uh, Musical Fidelity have waded into this. Um, I thought that was a bit less relevant because it's eight and a half grand and, you know, that's perhaps a little, a little spendy. Um, and then I can't say any more about it, but I've got a turntable from another manufacturer who's never made a turntable before on, on the bench at the moment. That's not going through for AVF. They're very insistent it's going through for one person. But um, it, yeah, there's, every time I think this has to be the point where it ends, uh, no, they, they just still keep coming. So <laughs> plenty of optimists. Um, Outside of the uh, wacky world of vinyl, though, uh, we've got uh, new Philips earphones as well. Yeah, just like it's been a busy few weeks for turntables, it's also been a busy few weeks for, for people who are interested in buying new headsets. Um, with Philips uh, among the candidates launching its new Fidelio L4 and T2 headsets in the next few weeks. Uh, both come in a slightly lighter graphene coated form. Uh, as you might expect, they're boasting about improved noise cancelling technology, better connectivity, Slightly better battery lives uh, across the two models. Uh, with the L4 over ear headphones priced at £349, the Fidelio T2 wireless earbuds come in at £279, uh, with another obvious side effect being that the largely impressive predecessor should also be getting some very nice discounts right about now. Yes, if you shop around on both of those. I mean, I've got the. Um... I've got the uh, what the ear the true wireless here at the moment. Uh, they are with Stop. me, Stop. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say that they have that if they're nothing else, they have the prices advantage that um, it doesn't feel like I'm I'm jamming a small boat into my ear. So, I've got to say um, these are I, I hate, and I really do passionately hate shoving anything into my ears. Um, these these are actually very they, very nice, very uh, very nice, and and the finish the titanium. So yeah, they, they, they put a lot of effort in. Uh, um, I'm doing a trip to London on Saturday, 
and uh, the acid test is whether I can walk across the concourse of Euston Station and how many dropouts I have. So uh, mm -hmm. we will, in the same way that I've done a review of the Focal Bathurst Dune, and I've actually got to fly and test them in an air in an airline situation. So it's the acid test and how these things should be done. So we won't say any more about that. Uh, I will do a review, and Phil will wade in with his thoughts as well. I'm sure. So. Um, but early signs are pretty positive. Um, elsewhere, we have got... I keep oscillating between the... Um, uh, yes, so we also have... Um, if vinyl is a bit tiresome, we have a new uh, streaming flagship from Audio Lab as well, don't we, Ian? Yeah, it's it's kind of the, the long-awaited uh, 9000N, which was uh, due to be with us at the, towards the tail end of last year, I believe. Um, but yes, finally with us. Uh, with yes. A tag of £2,499 to join the 9000A integrated amplifier and the 9000 CDT CD transport in the, as you might expect, the 9000 series lineup. Uh, obviously it comes with a bunch of uh, upgrades, got a new high-end chip uh, and that combination, as well as Audio Lab's own in-house circuitry. And they support just about every file format and streaming service. Do you know what? Someone also well. pointed out, Ian, in your comment, that you dutifully basically did the, um, you know, you looked through this press release and you picked up the points the press release had made. The press release had actually glossed over. The main thing about this is that it is the first Audio Lab streamer that doesn't have DTS PlayFi. Now, you can argue the pros and cons of DTS PlayFi. It's okay, but it's not sensational. This is not a DTS PlayFi product. Um, it's got uh, software which is used by a number of other streaming companies and by and large, it's supposed to be extremely good. So the expectation is pretty high on this one. Interestingly, in the rack as well at the moment is a Cyrus Stream XR, which is the Blue OS based Cyrus streamer. Now, sneak preview on that. If you can live without DSD support, it is utterly sensational. So the Audio Lab's got its work cut out, but I've requested one and we'll we'll see, you know, after lots, lots of time where people have basically given up seemingly on standalone streamers, they seem to have lurched back into life again. So we'll see which of these um, is the one that you should be spending over £2,000 on and indeed whether you should be spending £2,000 on it. So finally, or is it finally, or have I got how many more of these? Um, should we do these as a, as a duo? Because it's sort of the same, it's the same subject matter. We've got new noise cancelling headphones from Bose and Bowers and Wilkins doing fairly similar things. Yeah, yeah, I'd say things have been sort of quite busy on the headphone front. And uh, yeah, these guys uh, are attributed to that. Bose, the one with three new uh, headphones or headsets on the way, all due to launch in October. Well, two are due to launch in October, one's available now. Uh, is a new Quiet Comfort range, uh, leading with the Quiet Comfort Ultra headphones, set to replace the existing 700 headsets as their top of the line uh, headsets with improved noise cancellation, 24 hour battery life, and all the good things that come with it. Uh, that comes with a price tag of £449. Uh, the model that's out now is a slightly cheaper headphone alternative with the new Quiet Comfort headphones, come with similar noise cancelling uh, capabilities, 24 hour playback, but they're a little bit cheaper at £349. Uh, and if you're after something a little bit smaller from Bose, they've got the new Quiet Comfort Ultra earbuds uh, on the way with the new dynamic uh, mic mixing system and other fine tuning upgrades to the existing earbuds two models. Uh, those are also due to launch in October, priced at two hundred and ninety nine pounds. Um, but as for Bowers and Wilkins, they're basically upgrading their PX7 S2 wireless uh, headphones. Uh, we're adding an E to the name uh, for the PX7 S2 E. Uh, which come priced at £349 and essentially the same as the, the S2s, but they come with an upgraded digital sound processing engine that's been optimised to actually improve performance. Uh, and there's also some new premium versions of its black, grey and blue finishes and a brand new forest green option. So uh, I think it comes at the same RRP as the original S2 launched at. Uh, so as a straight contrast between the two, it seems like a natural upgrade. But mm. again, one of the upsides of the new model is that the older one, uh, it's now discounted. I think Bowers and Wilkins' website had it down to two hundred and seventy-nine pounds. So. That's a lot of headphone for two hundred and seventy-nine pounds. So yeah, yes, it, it looks like evolution rather than revolution. Actually, in both of these cases, to me, yeah. um, but nevertheless, um, both of these are strong players in their category. Um, Bose in particular, I've long maintained that if you're more interested in keeping the outside world at bay than the absolute last minutiae of musical detail. Bose takes a hell of a lot of beating. Their noise cancelling is absolutely sensational. And in many ways, the only reason that they were a bit behind on sound was because they refused to license sort of more elaborate Bluetooth formats, which may or may not have changed. 
Um, so yes, uh, we're going to try and have a look at those bits as well. Um, but it's a busy run in to finish certain bits before the editor's choice we spoke about earlier on. So we'll see what um, we can get done and when we can get it done. Um, you may or may not be pleased to know, those of you who um, have been following this for a while will know that ever since 2020, I've done a big mad review, which goes live on Christmas Day. I'm not going to say it too much, but I'm pleased to say that I have agreed this year's big mad thing for Christmas Day. Um, actually, it's not that big, but it is mad. Um, and AV Forums is going to be able to look at this mad thing in a way that no other site or magazine that we're aware of and the people supplying it are aware of are going to be able to look at it. So um, hopefully that's going to be one worth reading whilst you're pouring over the tap that your relatives have bought you on Christmas Day. So, right, before I talk about the Abbot, I want to talk, because in some ways they are related to one another, time for a brief moment of objective versus subjective. Um, this has been mentioned before. It's been talked about on a couple of occasions. People legitimately ask television reviews that Phil does are they are as much a set of scientific tests as they are his opinions on things. His opinions on things are formed by the television meeting or not meeting a series of criteria which are measured in exactly the same way for each television. It is a perfectly legitimate question to ask why I just sit there spouting from whichever orifice you choose to believe I'm spouting from. Um, the first is wholly practical. Um, to measure items of audio equipment to the standard to which the television reviews are measured. The hardware involved is significant in both scale, cost and expertise. Um, I have measured things a long time ago. I know the, the principles of it, but I'd probably need to spend a little bit of time getting back up to speed with it. Um, it's not a small undertaking. Believe it. Believe me when I say that um, Stuart uh, who runs the show and is a very objective human being would be very keen, but um, he's not so keen. He's willing to buy me a larger house, um, which is disappointing, but we'll see how we go there. Um, we are talking an, an order of thousands of pounds to do this correctly, especially when we talk about measuring loudspeakers. Now, um, there is the valid point before someone pops it into the comments that there are people doing measurements of certain products for quite a lot less money than that. Now, I don't want to disparage what they're doing because what they're doing is very interesting and at times it's very useful. However, truly great measurements being done by certain publications not only just go, ah, well, it hit this or it failed to meet its target. What then goes on is an examination of why it sounds the way it does based on the measurements that it produces. This is not a simple question of saying, oh, the synad is this or it missed its target output by this they dig down into what those measurements mean for what you're hearing. Now, the reason this matters is going back to the fact that Phil measures against a target. Hi-Fi doesn't have one of those. I mean, you can argue objectively that low distortion, um, decent signals to noise, etc. these are all admirable things, and they are. And to prove it, pretty much everything that's ever passed through AV forums, with the possible exception of a valve amplifier or two, puts in outstanding <laughs> measured performance. Um, to the extent we're getting het up over details that might appear on a test readout uh, sonically, they probably won't make an enormous and lasting amount and, of and difference. This, this is a very important point to make. And, and a lot of people who I respect in the industry who do take measurements for audio will also put their hands up and say exactly the same thing. Just because the machine or the measurements is saying that something is inadequate doesn't mean you can hear it. Mm. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, certain things will put up a nasty, but mm -hmm. I don't, I'm, yeah. try, I'm struggling to think of anything I've tested for this site in the last two or three years that would be genuinely doing that. So that mm -hmm. that's part of it. If we wanted to move to a measurement thing, I would want to do more than simply say, oh, it, you know, it farted out this. I'd like to know, I'd like to do a series of measurements that are sufficiently comprehensive to identify why the product is doing what it's doing. And with that goes back to the scale of the equipment required to do it and the amount of time it takes to actually and, and get the data the, out. The most important thing here as well, Ed, and it's why it's easier for me to do what I do here as opposed to measurement. Because I test audio here. I, I know this room, uh, it's been measured umpteen times. I've been here 20-odd years. 
I know exactly the right placement points within the room and what I'm going to get from the room and so on. Uh, when it comes to TV measurements and, and calibration, because uh, you're doing it to a set of standards, hmm. it says precisely what red, the coordinates for red should be and green and, and all the rest of it. It says, you know, what the measurements should be for brightness and black levels and all that kind of thing. And the, the thing is that the equipment that I use, the majority of the equipment I use, I can get rid of the whole room and concentrate on the display and take the measurements from the display. The display, apart from projectors, which you still measure from the projector and get rid of the room and then measure from the screen and, you know, look at the results as a whole. But um, in those times, I can get rid of the room and take mm. the measurements from the device and see what the device is, is actually capable of, of doing. Doing that with audio is nigh on impossible unless you have um, incredible facilities mm. where more or less a chamber. <laughs> yeah. It's like a chamber where you can put something in there and, 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 you know, manufacturers have them, you know, I've been in a couple of manufacturers rooms and, you know, yeah, it, you get your baseline measurements from that, but that is not realistic. That is not how it's going to perform in a room. And, you know, the, the room is the most important thing that yes. you put a speaker into. So if you put a speaker into certain shapes of rooms, you're going to get different results for for different um, room shapes and all the rest of it. And then how do you make sure that you have a baseline for your measurements? And how do your measurements then tally with somebody else's measurements? At least with calibration and with the testing that I'm doing, the objective testing I'm doing, and you made the point right at the start, and it's very, very important for people to understand, is that it's repeatable. Yes. All the tests that I do are repeatable and can be done over and over and over again with every different TV that comes through, the testing protocols, the testing way of doing things. It's all the same. It's a level playing field. Doing that with audio is nigh on impossible. No, it's it's a significantly thornier business. Now, the other bit, now it's time to get subjective about this. The other thing is... Um, and I know for a subset of people who either listen to this or have elected to listen to this bit if they're told about it, um, I maintain that chasing the best possible numbers and then simply applying those bits together in combination doesn't always work. I mean, if we uh, specifically one of the things that I'm, you know, I'm going to risk a bit of ire here, but uh, something that's become um, particularly prevalent is a testing of measurement um, SYNAD. So it's a combined distortion signal to noise measurement. And people get very, very excited about the SYNAD measurements of certain products. And it's like an extremely specific version of choosing a car based on its not 60 performance. And I say extremely specific because one, it's a dynamic measurement, so it changes depending on the load applied to the product. Now, if it's applying a line out to an amplifier, that's not particularly important. But if you're judging it uh, something to perhaps drive a pair of headphones, the Synad measurement is only ever going to be a snapshot it achieves at one tiny part of its measured performance. You may pair it with a pair of headphones where you never once hit that measurement. Um, and I feel quite strongly about this, not least because I did choose my current car almost wholly on measurements. And there are times when I deeply regret that decision. Yeah. Um, I chose the fastest thing I could lease for under £300 a month. Um, and I got it. Um, but there were some limitations in that particular method of choosing hardware. So I think there's some mileage in applying a little bit of experience to the actual business of sitting down and seeing what it does. For some people, what I write is not going to be relevant to their method of choosing things. And do you know what? I am completely and utterly relaxed with that. I put it to you that the part of the review up to the point where I say, how was it tested, still has some validity. Um, to choose my words carefully, I fondled a lot of knobs over the years. So um, there's, uh, you know, if I say something is particularly well made or particularly isn't well made, or it's got a, an operability issue that I think is a pain in the ass. And that's something where the benefit of spending a bit of time with it over and above popping over to a dealer or even getting it on limited time home dem, I'd argue that those bits are still valid. If you don't want to read about the sound quality bit and you wish to go elsewhere for measurements, that is, of course, your prerogative. But there are reasons why we've explained in a, in a cost and practicality sense why we haven't. And then on a more subjective level, I think in a world where we don't have the same standards that the televisions do, there is, there's room for a bit of gray area. Um, I mean, last year's product of the year, the neat petite classic, it measures pretty well. I've seen measured reviews of it, 
but you can buy a better measuring speaker for two thousand pounds once you've popped it into a uk lounge and you start listening to music rather than test tones on it i don't think you're necessarily going to find something which is actually more pleasurable to listen to that is our position on the 25th of september 2023 um it's constantly evolving if the means arose to do something about it either someone waded into this conversation saying i'd be prepared to stake my name to doing decent measurements and things like that we we'd talk to you we'd see what we could do yeah absolutely um, and it's it's always one thing that that we've made a point of at the editorial the whole point of, of our editorial even existing was that we were dissatisfied with what was going on elsewhere and how products were being tested back when we started which was 2003 2004 and, yeah. and, and onwards and you know things have moved on you know and and it continues to move on and and you know we will continue to look at what we're doing and and how that best serves you at the end of the day because if it wasn't for you listening to this or reading our reviews or taking an interest then we wouldn't be doing what we're doing and uh, the other thing is uh, and i think it's a unique thing to av forums um in terms of we not only have what i consider as uh, an extremely valuable editorial and, and professionally run editorial we have a huge community here yeah um and there's lots of people out there who own these products and who are talking about them on the forums and i think uh a little bit of um work on your part if you're looking at and, and everybody does this if you're interested in a product you don't just go and read one review and then base your buying decision on that and we understand that we're not yeah. here to tell you what you should go and buy we'll point you in the right direction of what your use case is and what we think are the best performing products for your use case because there is no such thing as a perfect tv there's no such thing as a perfect projector there's no such thing as a perfect speaker or an amplifier or a subwoofer it all depends on your use case what you're looking for at the end of the day and the products that will then fit with that and i think anybody that's sensible and looking for a product unless it's throw away money that you're happy to take a, a punt on something you're going to do your research and we hope that you're going to come to av forums and, and look at what we have to say and, and look at our editorial and, and the results that we've got whether it's a subjective review from ed and i trust ed you know i'm not just saying it because it's on the podcast and so on but i trust what ed's got to say and and his input but at the same time i'm interested in you know probably what what the forum members have to say as well mm -hmm. and, and we don't and there's only two or three products that come through the testing room that I live with for the year. And it's normally three flagship TVs because we like to keep at least three TVs so we can do comparisons through the year. And I live with those three TVs. But it's the only time I spend any great deal of time with the products. And it's something that all reviewers, we, we just don't have the time to. This is where the value of the forums comes in and our membership and you guys out there because you actually do go and invest your money in the products and spend the time. So read the reviews read what Ed's got to say, come and see the measurements for the TVs because we, we we know that those are accurate and so on. And also go and visit the forums and see what forum members think and, yeah. and what they're doing. And what and this is where it's important with Hi-Fi and audio. What products are they partnering said products with? Yes. Because there are so many different variables um, and, and so many setup options that you have. And how certain products, especially speakers, how they uh, react to different uh, amplifiers and different source material and so on. Um, you know, some speakers, if you marry them with a certain amplifier, will sound awful because they're not as well matched, Ed, as, no, no, as they should absolutely. be. I mean, you know, Bowers and Wilkins make some of the best speakers on the planet. But if you partner that with the wrong source or the wrong amplifier, they, they are the type of speaker, and I, uh, I think I'm accurate in saying that they live on the edge, Ed, especially yes. in the travel department. Oh, no, and, no, if it, you, and, it, and if you don't marry it correctly, they can sound awful. Yes. I mean, one of the reasons I have a pair of Focal Cantors here is that they are at times utterly merciless. So they're here to, to, to show things like that up. Um, I suppose an interesting case in point, the reason I've swapped this in, in around is the review that went live today, I'm going to talk about really very briefly, please just read the review, um, is the Avid Accent Integrated Amplifier. If we look at this through a pure by-the-numbers approach, a 70-watt amplifier 
with a phono stage, a headphone amp, four line inputs, all on RCA for four and a half thousand pounds. Mm, that seems a bit toppy, doesn't it? Um, the reality, the reality is that this is an outstanding product. This is what you get. Um, a, Avid is a is a measurement and engineering company. I have every confidence that the measurements that this thing puts in are spectacular. But more than that, uh, exactly what Phil was just saying about speaker matching. 70 watts, it doesn't sound that much. There are, You can buy amplifiers with a lot more power on paper than this. This thing, you'd have to be living in a hangar to run out of grunt with it. I was using it with the EPOS speakers I reviewed a little while back. Then pretty insensitive. They required more measured output. And I do check this with a voltmeter than um, most of the other speakers that are passed through with their price bracket. Avid didn't break a sweat. I, I didn't get anywhere near halfway with it. Um, it is an absolutely outstanding product. Um, one of the comments that's actually popped up in this whilst the podcast has been happening says it looks like a child woodwork project. Um, bring me that child, frankly. Um, they can um, they can start building other things for me, possibly at very cheap rates. Uh, this product, yes, it's not visually spectacular, but it is built like a lorry. I'll tell you an anecdote against myself on this one. Shortly after it turned up, uh, I actually needed to make a change to uh, the back, something at the back. So I pulled it slightly out of um, the uh, rack to get to the back, and I left it balancing. Um, actually, what happened is I turned my back, and it just toppled out of the rack. Uh, and this didn't damage the Avid in any way, shape, or form whatsoever, but it was enough momentum to tear uh, a set of phono plugs off one of the tone arms that I use without a moment's hesitation. This is an incredibly sturdy product. And the way that you interact with it, you just begin to realize that absolutely nothing is there that doesn't need to be there. And it's a it's a different design philosophy to the more ornate way of making high-end product, but it is very, very satisfying in its own way. And you just use it and feel that it would work indefinitely. So long as you don't pour boiling water over it or something like that, it's just going to keep going. Um, Honestly, this is one of the best bits of kit under five grand I I can remember testing. Um, if you have a digital source already, uh, it really, really, really needs to shoot straight up to something that you go and listen to for yourself. Obviously, don't buy it on the strength of the review, as we've just been talking. Get some more data. Um, but yeah, it's a peerless bit of kit. I've thoroughly enjoyed my time with it. I've only very, very reluctantly unlimited it from the rack this morning because there's something else that needs to be tested now. Reviews up on the site. If you've got any questions, please just ask. Um, but no, this is a, a late contender for 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 um, for featuring in uh, in editor's choice. So that's up on the site, and I hope you enjoy it. All that's left for me to do is um, album slash vinyl and podcast. Uh, sorry, podcast playlist of the podcast. Um, album and vinyl are combined this week. There's been a number of good things, not necessarily great things, but um, a band of which I am hugely fond called Hidden Orchestra released a new album uh, on Friday, just gone. Uh, it's called To Dream Is To Forget. Um, it's big, swirling orchestral meets electronica meets small instruments. Somehow it all hangs together rather nicely. Um, this is on all major streaming services. Um, you can also buy a uh, lossless copy on Bandcamp, which we've linked to on the uh, image there, and we can stick it into the comment thread if you're interested. I don't normally say this, but it's also the vinyl release of the month, but it is with a bit of reluctance. Having bitched about the Chemical Brothers last podcast, they then re went and reduced the price of the record, so I went and bought it anyway. This, I clicked through the link on that Bandcamp site, and I was taken to a page where I could buy the record for £27 in black because that's what I like, because I'm traditional. I accept that £27 is often the going rate for a double LP these days. That's fair enough. What I was less thrilled about is that they wanted £8.80 to ship it to a UK address, from where is unclear. On top of that, there was a handling charge of £2.10 to apparently cover exchange rate and other credit fluctuations. Again, from where it's shipping is unclear. So it's possible if it's coming from the UK, it's not incurring any of those. And then just to really cheer me up at the bottom of that page, it invited me to tip them. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and I declined, if I'm honest. Um, I've ordered it from Juno, who frequently get um, linked to for the album and podcast and playlist, sorry, album and vinyl thing, because Juno is an excellent retailer. You do, again, have to pay for shipping, and Juno's not selling it direct. Even so, despite those two things, it was still cheaper than buying it from the official link. So I, wherever possible, I like to support the artists as much as I can. I just felt that that was a little bit ambitious, and I would suggest that if you do want it on vinyl, you should shop around. If you do want it on vinyl, the omens are good. The back, um, the the track record of hidden orchestra things on in analog has been absolutely sensational. So that's why I I went for it. So that those are the recommendations there. Um, I've gone a bit mad for the playlist. Um, it cropped up on Spotify, and it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Uh, it is uh, where's it? Earth, it's gone. Uh, it is called Dark Ambient, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. But if you want sort of noise to happen in the background whilst you work, just gently brooding away, now the nights are drawing in, there's 11 and a half hours of it, so it can brood away for some time. Um, well worth a look. See what you think. Uh, you can tell me I'm deranged in the comments if you feel I am deranged in the comments. Okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, the hi-fi uh, section, Ed. Um, we covered a lot of things there, and I, I do think the objective versus, versus subjective, it's something we keep coming back to. But if you do have opinions, we really are interested in your mm -hmm. feedback. Uh, we really do take on your comments. Um, if there is a bit of a kit somewhere that we are overlooking or not aware of or, or whatever, um, and you think it may help us out, then you know, let us know. Um, Absolutely. If there's anything that you want to see within the reviews, um, and we can make it happen, we certainly will. So give us your feedback. The easiest way of doing that is to go to AV Forums, Forum List, right down the bottom, AV Forums Podcast, and look up this podcast. It's the one with Philips OLED Plus 908 in the, uh, in the title. And leave us a comment in there. And like I say, myself or Andy will pick up on the comment and add it to the next podcast running order. So we'll cover it in the next podcast. Um, anything else that we need to do tonight? I know I think we've covered everything. Uh, the only other thing I need to tell you about is if you do enjoy the podcast um, and you have enjoyed the podcast tonight and Patreon's maybe just a little bit too much for you at the minute and we do you know, appreciate the support there, but we do also appreciate that times are tight. You can buy us a coffee. Uh, buymeacoffee.com forward slash AV forums um, and do just that. Um, it helps in every uh, small donation helps uh, us in terms of putting together these podcasts, uh, improving the editorial, improving the site speed and everything else to make uh, the experience uh, more beneficial for you. And we only do it for you guys at the end of the day. So um, yeah, if you feel that that's worthy or we're worthy, then uh, buymeacoffee.com forward slash AV Forums. Much appreciated. The next uh, AV Forums podcast is a movies edition. It's along on the 2nd of October. And the guys, uh, Kaz and the guys, start at 8.30 if you want to watch that live and take part in the chat window. And then the next uh, AV Forums podcast, uh, which is this podcast, uh, will return in two weeks' time on the 9th of October at our usual start time of 7 p.m. if you want to watch us live. And, of course, all of our podcasts, as soon as they have gone live, uh, then appear on our YouTube uh, page or will appear on Spotify or iTunes um, as an audio-only version. I know that's the vast majority of you listening there. So thank you very much again for your support. Get your questions in, um, add them to the thread. We will get them answered. And, of course, we really need your opinions on the podcast. Give us your feedback. What do you like? What you're not too keen on? What you think we should maybe add that we don't cover already um, that's maybe obvious and we're just not seeing it? Uh, let us know. And uh, and we'll certainly look at adding that in. Uh, my thanks tonight to Ed and Ian. Thank you very much, guys. No worries. Thank you. And of course, uh, you can do all the usual cliched social media stuff, like, uh, subscribe, all the rest of it. Um, and if you can leave us a rating anywhere, especially five or ten stars, uh, then please do consider that. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for watching and listening. And we'll see you again soon. Good night.